This is a Sandy Boy Productions podcast. Welcome to the Urban Pharmacy Podcast, where we help women remove the overwhelm of living their most holistic life. This is the place to find evidence-based nutrition tactics, healthy lifestyle and wellness tips, abundance mindset, and easily implementable low-tox living strategies so you can rise up to your full potential and protect your family's health. I'm your host, Stacey Heine, certified holistic nutritionist and better living advocate. Now, let's get empowered with some simple swaps that make a big impact for optimal wellness. Welcome to episode 92 of the Urban Pharmacy Podcast. I hope that you are doing so well today. I have a lovely guest and a dear friend of mine, Hannah Rakowska, today on the podcast. And you're going to love, love, love this conversation. We talk all things cancer and we listen to her story. And I want to tell you a little bit about Hannah right now. She is a registered holistic nutritionist and certified holistic cancer practitioner. She currently maintains her private consulting practice in Vancouver and After overcoming cancer as a young woman and realizing the impact of nutrition on healing and recovery, Hannah became interested in the field of nutrition. She now specializes in working with individuals during and after cancer treatment to help them optimize treatment outcomes, mitigate treatment side effects, support recovery, and reduce the risk of recurrence through nutritional therapy and complementary holistic healing modalities. In the past, Hannah has held various roles, including nutrition operations manager for choices markets and nutritionists at various medical clinics such as change pain and care medical group hannah has developed educational seminars and programs for individuals with chronic pain cancer and cardiovascular disease she has also been featured on television shows such as ctv morning live cbc and global news hannah's mission is to raise awareness about the role of dietary and lifestyle factors in the prevention and suppression of cancer as well as the importance of nutrition support and complementary therapies during cancer treatment so as i told you and as you heard just there you're going to hear a lot about cancer today and again through hannah's story what she has learned and how she supports her clients through all of this Hannah was actually a guest speaker in Holistic Mama Society, my monthly membership, which is doors open right now for you to join so that you can learn about holistic living and how to eat more plant-based, which is coinciding with cancer prevention and suppression. And um, it was a a glorious conversation that we had behind closed doors as well. So I wanna make sure you know that you are invited to join me in the holistic mama society world over in my monthly membership you can gain access to all of the past trainings all about holistic nutrition all about holistic living low tox living and mindset work and uh you know you can grow it's a minimum of six months and the growth that many women have seen who have joined is pretty exponential if you're ready to change your life take control of your health and your wellness and really shift your mindset to a place of yes i can yes i will and yes i am doing this mentality then you need to join us on the other side you will have access to me to work one-on-one and we will have weekly sessions to learn and expand our knowledge on all things holistic living and a lot about plant-based eating as well. So again, click the link down in the show notes to explore joining Holistic Mama Society. If you have any questions, just click the link down in the show notes that says Calendly and you can schedule a call with me uh, for free and you can learn more about what it would be like to work together and if Holistic Mama Mama Society is for you. All right, without further ado, here is Hannah and I know you're going to love this episode. Be well. Hannah Rokowska. Dear friend, welcome to the Urban Pharmacy Podcast. Hi, Stacey. Thank you so much for having me on. Really appreciate it. Uh, Hannah and I know each other through Instagram, and um, she and I have become friends 
teammates working together to advocate for just better living in general and a healthy lifestyle and super excited to be along this wellness journey with her. And, um, Hannah, I wanted to have you on because you know, all things cancer, that's what you do. And you help people, uh, that are going along a journey that have cancer. You also help people understand how to prevent it. And I can't wait to hear all about that today. Yes. I don't know if I know all things about cancer, but I do (laughs) try my best to know as much as I possibly can to help my clients and public, um, public around prevention for sure. (laughs) So yes. Yeah, I know. I said that and I was like, oh, I shouldn't have said that because none of us know all the things, but you, you really do. Um, this is what you spend a lot of your time doing understanding and, um, mechanisms of cancer and figuring out how to help people. So Mm -hmm. tell me a little bit now about how this all started for you and, um, a little bit about your journey toward health. Yeah. Great question. Of course, it all, it always starts somewhere. Hey? And I'm, I was actually really lucky that for me, it started at the age of 19. I was actually in the dental hygiene program going towards, well, towards the program. And I found a lump in my neck, um, just basically a little tiny nodule in my neck above my collarbone area. And it turned out to be Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, I went through, you know, the whole journey of navigating through my treatment options. And for some reason, my gut feeling told me that the chemotherapy and the radiation that was proposed, uh, for stage four cancer, when I had stage one, uh, was not really aligned with what I had. And I walked away from the uh, cancer agency here in British Columbia. I found some books on nutrition and herbal medicine, uh, traveled to Peru, (laughs) Lima, Peru to an oncology Institute where they treated uh, cancer with botanical medicine, as well as chemotherapy. Uh, That's where I kind of got just a week's of um, a a week's worth of really intensive nutrition and uh, herbal medicine education around my cancer and how I could help uh, support its healing. And I came back to Vancouver, BC uh, with that knowledge, switched over to a whole food plant-based diet, uh, drank copious amounts of herbal teas, I found a new oncologist in Vancouver who supported the nutritional therapy and botanical medicine aspect of my treatment, Uh, basically diversified, individualized my treatment to include one eighth of the original proposed treatment because my tumor had already shrunk by that point from nutrition and uh, herbal medicine. And I ended up having a much smoother treatment, uh, I know for a fact, because of what I was doing in terms of complementary medicine and a huge part of that was nutrition. And as soon as that process, that whole journey ended, I realized how many people were suffering from not just cancer, but the effects of its treatment. And I wanted to help other people going through it so that um, they could maybe experience fewer side effects and enhanced treatment outcomes like I had. And uh, because cancer is a very serious disease, obviously, but the modern treatments, the conventional treatments can be what actually um, leads to mortality in some cases. So I just wanted to help other people dealing with it. Yeah. Most people don't, I mean, like so many people and even myself up until just not that long ago, maybe the last few years, didn't realize that like, like you just said, the cancer treatments that are proposed are oftentimes the ones that actually take us out versus Mm -hmm. the disease itself. So I don't know why it really hit home for me. It was probably like Chris beat cancer. Chris, um, I can't remember his last name, but Chris work. Yeah. (laughs) Chris work. It was probably something that he said. And I was like, Whoa, like it, I finally like really connected the dots. Um, so how did you feel when you were diagnosed? I felt complete. I think like everybody feels, you know what the feeling was everything that mattered to me before that point, like dating or small little friendship problems. I was 19. Right. So dealing with, you know, maybe some work drama or whatnot, everything just disappears in the matter of, you know, half a second and the ground beneath you just disappears. And you feel like you're just in complete shock and I mean, I think shock is the the biggest uh, feeling I felt. And then fear comes, overtakes you. And then just a complete sadness of, you know, how can this be happening to me? And to be honest with you, and this is maybe 
I, I feel like this is a little bit maybe embarrassing, but it's a feeling that a lot of women go through. Um, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose my hair. Like that was the first yeah, yeah. Kind of th- or the second thought first is I'm, I'll lose my life. And then it was, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose my hair and I'm about to go into school. And how, how would that, how will that look? Right. How much, how my, how will my life be changing from this point on? But um, yeah. And then, so then, you know, walking away from that um, proposed treatment, because it was just a standard protocol, it was individualized. Uh, that gave me the power to learn about complementary therapy and to really just take charge of my life and realize that I can support my body alongside conventional treatment as well. And that is what gave me that, that motivation and the enthusiasm to actually heal from this and to, to approach it from a totally different angle, which was basically, okay, how have you been living your life, Hannah, (laughs) which is not very healthy. And let's just, you know, refocus and actually heal this thing because it's just a a symptom of a, of a larger imbalance in the body. Right. And so Mm -hmm. it's not just about tumor. It's about multiple biochemical things that happen obviously that are out of balance out of whack and I had been doing all the things to support those imbalances in my life (laughs) until that point (laughs) wow and isn't it so interesting that you just said what complementary and Mm -hmm. then conventional Mm -hmm. I feel like and it's like it's easier for me to say that because whatever I'm not a doctor or I've never had cancer all the things, but it's sad that we're living in a day that the conventional is the allopathic way. And I'm not dogging that. Like there is totally need for this. Right. But instead of it being the other way around, like what you said, complimentary or like a more holistic natural approach that should, in my opinion, that should be the first thing that we do. And then the complementary would be what we call the conventional way. It's just an interesting, it's just an interesting world we're living in these days. Stacey couldn't have said any better. Honestly, there's a great book called Life Over Cancer by Dr. Keith Block. He runs an integrative center in Illinois. And he like, it's like the greatest guide, I think, for any cancer patient, um, because he talks about exactly that. Uh, you know, the allopathic standard cancer care reduces the the primary tumor bulk, like surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, it shrinks the tumor. But does that actually complete your treatment? No, because there are renegade cancer cells that probably escaped uh, at that point of time. Um, Studies show that people, cancer patients in remission who have been told that they're in remission, 50% of them actually have metastases, metastases to other sites of the body. And those cancer cells can then, you know, re- group and develop a tumor at that site. Right. And so complete cancer treatment requires an entirely holistic approach and healing the body and, you know, looking at all the different, the, the hostile environment that you had prior to cancer that helped its development, like the oxidation levels in your body, the inflammation levels in your body, the gut microbiome imbalance, high blood sugar, um, blood coagulation, and just so many factors are involved. And if you just remove the tumor, you're not really, you're not really treating the the cause and you're not really treating the entire disease. And, um, and many times, and oftentimes it does, it it recurs because we're not actually treating and we're not actually healing the entire, the entire disease itself. Wow. Wow. That I did not know statistically, um, about 50%, you said people who have told that they're in remission. There's renegade cells. That's crazy. That's sad. Um, Mm -hmm. that's shocking and sad. Okay. Let me, I just have a real, really random question that just popped in my mind. So I want to ask you that now before I forget it. Did you do juicing protocol? Yeah, Stacey, honestly, um, I always forget to mention this, but yes, that was a huge part of my, of my treatment. And I always forget to mention this. Uh, okay. My parents bought a juicer. We, they might like literally my dad um, quit his job and just stayed home with me and made me herbal teas and juices, you know, every hour on the hour herbal tea juice. And it was um, all day. <laughs> wow. I, I couldn't eat beets for a very long time after that, because once, when you're going through chemo and, and drinking certain things, it's uh, you become kind of averse to them, but yeah, juicing was a huge part of my protocol. And that's why um, 
I do recommend juicing for my clients uh, currently if they're going through something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, because I haven't heard you talk about that very much. And um, I know you, you use herbs. You're like, well, yes, that was like half of the part, Uh, but yeah. Okay. So, uh, and I don't want to give all of the things away because you're going to be a guest um, in holistic mama society. And we're going to get going, we're going to go into like an even deeper dive in there. Um, but I want to ask you, Hannah, when did you realize that plants eating plants is really the way to go? Like what were some red flags that you saw that potentially other foods like animal products would be conducive to cancer? Like when did that all happen for you? Uh, yeah. So basically I, I didn't really make the, the entire, I mean, honestly, we're learning every day. Right. But I didn't make the full connection. I would say till five years later. Um, you know, I really was so focused on just, um, juicing and eating whole food plant based based on what the oncologist in, in Peru told me to do, but I didn't really realize why. And of course, like my blood markers improved during chemo. My oncologist here in Vancouver was, you know, shocked. He's like, I I don't know why your blood markers are staying the same. They're not, you know, they're not out of whack. Like you, like you would usually see with, uh, on chemotherapy, like your white blood cells aren't changing and, and, uh, everything is really, really stable. So I saw, I saw those aspects of it and I realized, okay, like I'm doing something right here, but I didn't really realize why plants were so healthful until I went to school until I just decided to, okay, I need to study this in more detail. If I really want to help people, I can't just talk about, you know, juicing and eat your legumes and, and bean or, um, and greens. I have to actually get an education around it. And that's when I learned about the, the importance of, um, or the impact of a plant forward lifestyle around cancer and, uh, you know, reducing inflammatory foods and carcinogenic foods that are often present, um, or, well, carcinogens that are often present in, in meat and, uh, animal foods, as well as ultra processed foods mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that kind of happened within five years of my diagnosis. Yeah. Wow. So can you, um, can you break down, like, let's talk about animals and animal products. Like what about them? I I don't want to say cause cancer, but like, what about them helps the progression of cancer cells that we all have in our body, right. That we get to, we get largely to choose if we're turning on or off through lifestyle, not all the way, but like a huge part. What is it about animal products and their their byproducts that, that are causing this growth? Wonderful question. It's actually, it's a lot more loaded than people might imagine. Cause it's not just one, one aspect. It's actually various aspects. And no, you say, see, so you're right. There's, um, so dietary factors are linked with, um, are directly related to 30 to 35% of all cancers. And a large part of that is of course the intake of animal foods, right? So animal foods have several carcinogenic potential factors. Uh, the one that we hear about mostly just based on the world cancer research funds uh, data is the, the aspect of cooked meat carcinogens. So the heterocyclic uh, amines that are formed when we cook meat, uh, as well as the uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are formed when basically from the, the smoke and mm-hmm. like the juices dripping from meat when we're grilling or barbecuing and then they go, would go into the smoke and then the fumes go into the meat and then we eat those carcinogens. So there are the, the cooked meat carcinogen, uh, carcinogens as one category. Heme iron is also another one. And so the, sorry, the cooked meat carcinogens are directly cancer causing. Uh, the World Cancer Research Fund has actually classified uh, them as carcinogens. And we know that Red meat is a, a probable human carcinogen, uh, grade 2A carcinogen. We know that processed meat is a grade or group 1 carcinogen. So it's it's the evidence is really, really strong in terms of it being carcinogenic to humans. Uh, and one aspect of that is the fact that there are cooked meat carcinogens in both red meat and processed meat. Another aspect are the n nitroso compounds that are found in, in meat, um, not just cooked meat, but even raw meat. And the N-nitroso compounds are basically 
compounds that include nitrosamines and nitrosamides, and both of those can damage the gut lining and can then lead to or promote cancerous changes within our gut lining and can lead to colorectal cancer. It's mainly with me, the, the main link is with colorectal cancer. There's also some association with breast cancer, prostate cancer, uh, and other gastric cancers, but the main association is with colorectal cancer risk. Um, so we have the cooked meat carcinogens, we have the n nitrosyl compounds in meat. Heme iron, as I mentioned, also is a stimulates the production of n nitrosyl compounds. And the other aspect is our gut bacteria. When we have a, a meat diet, a, sorry, a diet that's high in meat products and saturated fat as a result, we actually harbor gut bacteria that then convert bile acids from the liver into secondary bile acids that are carcinogenic. And those actually, those bile acids lead to the formulation of free radicals, which are of course, uh, carcinogenic and can wreak, uh, wreak havoc on our, on our um, gastrointestinal tract and can lead to cancerous changes. So, and mutagenic changes. So there are various compounds in meat. Um, and also the one that we hear about a lot when we talk about, for example, breast cancer is the estrogen um, and other growth promoting factors in meat and other animal products. Uh, you know, when, when we're talking about, for example, dairy, dairy is um full of estrogen because the mother cow has to be i mean she's producing milk for her for her calf so there's estrogen in her milk there's also insulin like growth factor in milk and that's also present of course in both of those are present in meat as well as other growth factors and growth factors have been found to be linked with increased risk of, of various cancers so like we know that women who have high insulin like growth factor levels in their blood have an increased risk of breast cancer, up to 30% increased risk of breast cancer, for example. So uh, there are so many factors in, in animal foods that are problematic. Hey, before we get too far into this episode, I wanna invite you to my upcoming cooking class. It's called Food for Life, Cancer Prevention and Healthy Body Weight. And you might not know, but an increased body weight, one that is over what we're looking for in terms of a BMI and your ideal body weight can actually be linked to increased risk of cancer. And I think we could say that we're all looking for our ideal body weight and we're all looking for a way to prevent cancer, right? So I'm here to help you do that, just that. So we're going to basically go through about an hour long of education and cooking demo. And I'm going to help you understand how to find a healthy body weight and prevent cancer at the same time by putting more plants on your plate. There will be education, a cooking demo, and recipes provided for you. So just click down in the show notes to get registered for my upcoming Food for Life class with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. You're gonna love it. I'll see you there. Now, you were talking about processed meat. Can you break that down a little bit um, mm -hmm. so that people can understand what that means? Yeah. So processed meats are any meats that are cured or smoked, preserved essentially. And they include, uh, foods that, well, pro processed meats that are a huge part of our diet in North America, unfortunately, the Even ones that are found on charcuterie boards. Can we just say yes. that out loud? Please? Yes. Oh my goodness. Every time I see a charcuterie board on Instagram, I'm just shaking my head. Like this is literally like promoting cigarettes to people. Yeah. Yeah. And a group one carcinogen, a proven carcinogen by the world leading authority on cancer risk and diet, the world cancer research fund. And it's not being blasted across TVs and radios all over the place. Like, and we're just still doing this. Right. And, and a lot of these, uh, a lot of, uh, health practitioners are even posting photos of, of, um, charcuterie board. So yeah, these meats include, uh, bacon, <laughs> ham, uh, all sorts of deli meats, sausages, hot dogs, uh, beef jerky, probably missing a few here, but yeah, anything that's basically processed, cured, smoked. Yeah. Um, yeah. Salami, bologna. salami. And then, you know, first off, I have to say two things about this. It makes me super angry that my child who's in, he's like in homeschool and like, we're learning words and all that stuff. I can't get over how many times there's like meat in like, <laughs> in their teachings 
like the word ham and like, it's all over. And I'm like, ah, and then there's hot dogs. And we're just like, like, I get it. I get it to an extent, but like, why don't you put a plant in there? Why don't you put some broccoli in there instead so that they can learn how to say broccoli, right? Like spell that Mm -hmm. out, like instead Mm -hmm. of, um, whatever, just anyways, it, I'm starting to see how, um, there's conditioning involved here. A lot of conditioning, a lot of programming with just subsidized, yep. subsidized foods that are keeping us all sick. I mean, and it's even being taught to our children. So that, and then also with processed meat, like there are so many, I call it neutral washing because it's just like the beauty industry, like greenwashing or, you know, cleaning products and stuff like that, where you think you're getting something safer. You're not, there are cured there's bacon, there's turkey sausage, there's all this stuff. And it's like without nitrates, but guess what? Celery extract is the same. It actually like, it's a different way to preserve it. It's a different form of nitrate, right? But it does the exact same thing in your gut. So don't get fooled when it comes to buying processed meat that says nitrate free. It's no different. And it still is promoting cancer growth. I had to get that out of the way. Yeah, no, that's actually excellent because even in nutrition school, I remember we learned about this and, uh, we like, uh, we learned, we learned the, the opposite basically telling us that it's okay. Like it's okay to, 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 to consume these foods because they are, you know, celery juice is used as, as the preservative, not Mm -hmm. other aspects. So yeah, great point because it does have the same effect. Yeah. And another thing I want to say, like most people don't realize is that sometimes we think about, well, like nitrates are present in, in plant foods as well, right? They are. Uh, but the thing is, is that the body converts nitrates into either, either N nitroso compounds or nitric oxide, which is really, really healthy and, and, and health promoting. Um, and the thing is, is that the polyphenols and the antioxidants in our plant foods are actually what help the conversion of nitrates that we ingest into nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. Uh, So like they favor the conversion to nitric oxide rather than, uh, and nitroso compounds. So I just wanted to say that there's a confusion around that as well. Yeah. There's really, there is a lot of confusion around that. And I try to explain this to my dad and he's just like, nah, like what it just, I'm like, no, like seriously, please. Oh, anyways. Okay. Let's move on to ultra processed Mm -hmm. foods. Hannah, can you explain to us really what that means? And then also how are these ultra processed foods promoting cancer? Yeah. So the, the ultra processed food, uh, topic is actually, I feel like it's, it's a newer topic in the world of nutrition and can- cancer risk and nutrition. Uh, we've always talked about, you know, refined sugar and animal products, but ultra processed foods are kind of their own category nowadays. And it's because uh, more and more studies are coming out and regarding them. And so ultra processed foods are, of course, all the foods that we find that are prepackaged, uh, frozen foods, gas station pastries, chips, cookies, biscuits, etc. And of course, refined sugar falls into that ca- category as well. And they are basically now um, studies are now showing that the consumption of ultra processed foods is, in fact, linked to an increased risk of cancer. Uh, I don't want to butcher the statistics. So I'm just going to take a quick peek at the statistics. Um, but it's Oh, I don't actually have them in front of me. I believe that the, the consumption of processed ultra processed foods increases our cancer risk by about 12% mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of various cancers. And so scientists actually aren't aware of the, the specific mechanisms or the specific factors involved, because there are so many, there are so many additives, preservatives, you know, stabilizers, colorants, gum, you know, gums, et cetera, that are involved. And so we don't actually know the specific, um, wow. there, but there are, because there are just so many, and of course we want to stay away from those foods. They're ultra processed. They're not in their whole state. Um, they're not whole food plant-based by any means. And so, you know, they, they can certainly be a part of a healthy diet, but they should be a minimal part of a healthy diet if anything at all. Yeah. So mm-hmm. what are the top cancers? 
Our main cancers in North America are colorectal cancer, well, lung cancer is number one, uh, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, the gastric cancers, uh, the hormone driven cancers are the, the leading causes of death and cancer. And we now know that diet is related to, you know, on average 35% of those cancers. Uh, but the degree to which dietary factors are related to cancers vary according to the type. So for example, with colorectal cancer, which I believe is the second leading cause of, of cancer related death in North America. Yeah. Um, so diet is related to, they're saying now between 70 to 90% of all colorectal cancers are directly caused by diet and lifestyle. Uh, so does not surprise shocking. me, right? It's just, it's shocking. It's shocking that it's not, um, I don't know. I, I always find it just so shocking that we, we were so, we were so, um, fearful around, you know, COVID for example, where the risk of death was relatively low for people who weren't at risk or who didn't have, you know, chronic diseases. But when we look at something like cancer, where the risk is, you know, the risk of developing cancer in your lifetime in North America is about 40%. So it's about one in one in two, right. In, in yeah. the States, about one in three in Canada, uh, one in two in the UK. And so when we look at that, I mean, shouldn't these factors that we have so much control over be just literally all over the news every single day when it's costing our healthcare system, billions of dollars a year to try to treat these diseases. Right. But unfortunately it's just not, um, with breast cancer, for example, the, the studies are showing that diet is related to approximately 50% or up to 50% of all breast cancer uh, cases with even with pancreatic cancer, about 50%. So we, you know, we know that dietary cancers, hormone driven cancers are very, very strongly linked to what we're eating and how we're living. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when it comes to your clients that you get that have cancer, mm -hmm. what is your, what are your like top three things that you immediately tell them to do? Even, I mean, like, is there a way to say that like, or is it different based on each cancer type or is it pretty much the same? Like in terms of, <laughs> in no, terms of like the gross, like, you know, the mm -hmm. basics. The ba yeah, the basics are always present. The foundation is always there. Uh, so we start with the, the cancer protective diet, of course, cause that's the number one thing that we have control over. That's the easiest thing that we can actually, um, alter. And that's actually the most powerful way to alter our body chemistry is through our nutrition. So our biochemistry, so anti-cancer diet, number one, and because we know that the diet that's linked with prevention is a whole food plant-based diet. We know that that's been established in research for the last 40 years. Uh, so that diet is the one that I recommend during treatment as well, as much as possible, as much as is feasible for someone. Of course, it does vary according to, to the cancer type and in terms of how much, like if they can actually eat solid foods at that mm -hmm. point in time, but we always focus on uh, plants as much as possible. So focusing on whole grains, legumes, uh, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds, and looking at the protein intake is really, really important for cancer patients because they need more than someone who's not going through treatment and looking at, um, just support. Yeah. Supporting their, their protein status is really, really important. Looking at whether or not they have weight loss at diagnosis, uh, so that they don't, um, basically fall into malnutrition. So there's some aspects that are very, very different, but the main diet is the same. And then I always talk about physical activity to, you know, to move the lymphatic system as much as the lymphatic fluid, as much as possible. Uh, to help detoxify the body that way uh, when you're going through treatment that's really really important to support the immune system and support detoxification uh, processes so like rebounding I, chris work is a huge fan of that you talked mm -hmm. about chris work uh you know walking every single day lymphatic drainage massages are really important um, in that case as well and then i would say the third pillar is the mind body spirit pillar which is basically shifting into a healing mindset and really um, yeah, adopting spiritual practices to help you with, and, and mindfulness practices to really, to help with, um, supporting the body and its healing, its healing abilities that we have, you know, innate 
innately and that we have access to always, but it's really, really hard to tap into those when we're in a state of fear um, and mm-hmm. shock upon diagnosis. So that's, those are my three things, diet, movement, spiritual practice. What are your favorite spiritual practices? Uh, you know, for it's, it's always, it's different according to the client, but for myself, I love meditation. I love pranayama breathing, uh, prayer, prayer. I think prayer is what got me through my treatment. I would say I wasn't really, I wasn't, um, introduced to meditation until much later in my, in my life, but prayer is what I just did innately naturally. And I would just pray for two hours a day even, and, you know, just ask God for help and guidance of getting me through this and, and making sure that, or not making sure that, but asking for guidance toward the right practitioners and the right people to support me along my treatment. And honestly, everything, everything that I prayed for, um, I don't know how I've got this lucky, but everything just kind of flowed. Wow. I did meet the right practitioners and I was supported in ways that I never expected or imagined. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. And we're so (laughs) glad that you're here, my friend. Oh my goodness. Oh, so many um, of us go through this though, right? So many people go through cancer. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Give me some cancer stats again. Oh, cancer stats. So the, the, the lifetime risk of actually being diagnosed yes. with cancer within your life as a female is about 38% in North America. Okay. Uh, as a male, it's 37% in North okay. America. Uh, cancer rates are on the rise there, you know, by the year 2030, we're expected to have, I think, 27 million cases of cancer in 20, 2012. It was, I don't want to get this wrong, but I think it was 12 million, a lot less. It's a lot less. Yeah. So they're expected to rise by like 70% in the next 20 years. Oh my goodness. So prevention is really like prevention is really where we have to focus because treatment isn't I mean, we don't have a cure for cancer, right? It's not so. always guaranteed, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and then is is the prevention the same, like in terms of preventing and then preventing the occurrence? Um, is it the same? That's another, uh, Stacey, it's like you read the book, Life Over Cancer. I because I'm just <laughs> reading it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so do- like Dr. Keith Block, the, the physician that wrote the Life Over Cancer book that I'm talking about is he says this, he's like, you know, people focus on the the active treatment aspect of things and, and, you know, reducing tumor bulk and, and being in remission and getting that stamp of approval. And then things tend to kind of stop and we think we're in remission and it's all good, but that's actually when the prevention aspect of, and suppression of cancer cell growth needs to be the most aggressive is exactly at that time, because now we've been probably through chemo, we've been through radiation or surgery, our body's been through uh, you know, a top like exceptional amount of toxicity and stress. Um, we may have metastases that have escaped that original tumor bulk. And that's, and this is the time now the post treatment is actually the time to be most aggressive to make sure that, not, that those cells are targeted and hopefully eradicated through nutrition and complementary treatments and lifestyle habits. And then just to make sure that, yeah, that we don't, um, that we don't have cancer recurrence because oftentimes, for example, when cancer returns 20 to 25 years later, and we think, oh, we got cancer again, it's actually the same cells, the same, the same cancer stem cells that were, that were not um, eradicated through our initial treatment that have now reestablished themselves at a different site in the body or same site of the body uh, and have now come back and formed into a new tumor. And we think it's a new cancer, but it's not. So mm. that's why like the, the, the recurrence prevention stage is, I think, I mean, for me, it's just what I, I don't think about it every day, but I live my life in the way that it's always in the back of my mind. Like you're, you know, Hannah, like you're not out of the, you're not out of the woods. It's been 17 years, but you're not out of the woods by any means. Yeah. Wow. Can you talk? Um, we're going to, we actually have another ep- We have an interview. We yes. have another talk here coming up in holistic mama society right after this. Bless you friend for giving me so much time. Um, but before we wrap this overview up on the podcast, can you touch on alcohol? Yeah, uh, of course. Alcohol. So the studies now, um, they just came out like what, three months ago, the world cancer research fund, uh, came out with a statement that says, that said that uh, there is no safe 
intake for alcohol Mm -hmm. in terms of cancer. Uh, So, you know, we've always thought that, oh, a glass of red wine can help, you know, it has resveratrol and that's cancer protective. And uh, part of that is true. Resveratrol is cancer protective, but resveratrol is found in the, you know, the skin of grapes and strawberries and various um, fruits and other plant foods and alcohol contains ethanol, which is then converted into um, acetaldehyde, which of course is a carcinogen or many people don't know that it's a carcinogen, but it's a carcinogen. And so there is no safe intake for alcohol, unfortunately. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you for for just, yeah. Thank you for Mm -hmm. laying that out there. Um, I ask this question to everybody, Hannah, and I want to know from you, um, what does holistic living mean to you? Oh, I love that question. Uh, I believe it's holistic living is embracing your whole person. So embracing your physical health through nutrition and lifestyle and realizing that that's only half of the equation. There's also this, a soul there. And that to me is, you know, your mental health, your spiritual health and your emotional health. So I look at it that way. I look at, I look at holistic health that way and just making sure that we are, we are, we are caring for our whole person and not just focusing on, for example, exercise. If you're only fo- focusing on exercise and green juices, healing won't be healing will never be complete. You have to focus on your soul and your spiritual health and your mental health. I love that. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much for your wisdom. And I hope that this helps people realize the importance, Hannah, of just prevention is key. And I encourage just everybody that's listening to this to not just think about cancer prevention in your life, but think about the just prevention of, I mean, cause cancer is our number two killer, right? Uh, for the States. Yeah. Almost number one, you guys are getting up there. Yeah, we are. And that's so, number one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right on. Oh, in where you are in Canada, it's number one. Mm-hmm. That's sad. So yeah. yeah, heart disease is number one, cardiovascular disease, but cancer's right up there. You guys, we have to protect ourselves. Okay. And like, we don't have to live in a bubble, but we do need to keep it in mind that like, if we want to prolong our life and not only just the, the years of our life, but, but maximize the actual years that we have in our life. Like we need to focus on prevention because we matter and we have one life here on earth. And right now we're living in it and we want to make sure that we are, uh, just protecting our beautiful bodies. So Hannah, do you have anything that you want to leave before, uh, you know, like any last thoughts we you want to leave before we, um, learn where to follow you and, uh, the things that you have to offer. Let's say Thank you for having me on Stacey. Cause like he just said, prevention is, uh, I don't think we, we care about it enough because <laughs> yeah. we don't really think about it until it, something happens, but right, I right. think you just put it so beautifully. Like we have to just think about, yeah, living our life to the fullest. And if we want to do that, we need to prevent the diseases that we have control over and mm-hmm. we have so much power over that. And I think that's, you wrapped it up beautifully. Thank you. Now, where can we find you and what do you have? Anything that you want to share with us? Any, I mean, how do you work with people? Share all that stuff. Yeah. So my, my website is back to balance nutrition.com. Uh, my services are on there. I currently am doing one-on-one coaching. I also have a seven day anti-cancer diet kickstart e-course that uh, people can find on my website and on Instagram. I'm at back to balance nutrition as well as Facebook. So awesome. Yeah. Okay, everybody go follow Hannah because she's a wealth of knowledge and so fun. So thank you friend. And I will see you in the society soon. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So much. Yeah. Having- thank you. I'm over here cheering you on because you just finished another episode of the urban pharmacy. For today's show notes, head on over to the urbanpharmacy.com and be sure to join us inside our private Facebook group called The Urban Pharmacy, where we share inspiration, live trainings, and holistic living tips to help you build community and the healthy lifestyle that you've always wanted. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you hit that subscribe button and please consider leaving us a five-star review. Before we connect again on the next show, follow me on Instagram at the urban pharmacy that's urban with an H and pharmacy with an F. 
And I can't wait to hear your wellness journey as we get to know each other better. You know, there's truly no better time than now to level up your life. And I am so proud of you for showing up today. Until next time, be well, Health Crusader.